from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Tonight, I want to talk on fools. And I want you to turn with me to the third chapter of 1 Corinthians, beginning with the 18th verse. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. A couple years ago, Anthony Newley sang, What kind of a fool am I? to the top of the charts. And uh, I looked up in the dictionary to see what a fool is, or one of my associates did for me. And the Bible has a lot to say about fools and what a fool is. Proverbs 10, 21, it says, fools die for the want of wisdom. Proverbs 1, 7 says, fools despise wisdom. Uh, when P.T. Barnum came to this country many years ago, he said, the American people want to be fooled and I'm here to fool them. He said, a fool is born every minute. And uh, now synonyms that you can find for the word fool is stupid person, bonehead, blockhead, simpleton, chump, nitwit, goose, sap, numbskull, ignoramus, beetlehead, whatever you want. A uh, one who has been imposed on by others, a stooge, a gullible, or a dupe. Now in the Bible, it may mean all of this, but it also has a moral meaning in the Bible and is a very important word in the Bible. And the verses seem almost paradoxical. 1 Corinthians 3.18 says, Let him become a fool. And Proverbs 1.7 says, Fools despise wisdom. And God is speaking from the divine standpoint. In one passage, the fool is an unthinking, thoughtless, careless person without true understanding. In the other passage, the word fool is used from the standpoint of people who have received Christ because the world laughs at them and says they're foolish and ridiculous. They're fools. So there are unwise fools and they're wise fools. Now Jesus said, whoever calls his brother a fool is in danger of hellfire. You be very careful how you call another person a fool. I wouldn't dare use that name for you or for anybody else. Never use the word fool in anger, the Bible says. But I'm telling you what God says about it in certain instances. First, there's the atheistic fool. It's repeated twice in Psalm 53.1 and Psalm 14.1. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. But in Hebrew, it actually means there is no God for me. In other words, the this fool deliberately says, there is no God for me. He's not saying there's no God. He's saying there's no God for me. Then there's the practical atheist. You see, there are many people that are really not atheists, but they are practical atheists in the sense that they live like an atheist. You profess to believe in God, but you don't live like you believe in God. You live as though there is no God. You too, in a sense, are an atheist. And there are hundreds here tonight like that. You believe in God with your mind. You may go to church, but you live as though God does not exist as far as you are concerned. And so you are an atheist in a sense. And then secondly, the Bible talks about the mocking fool, the mocking fool. Fools make a mock of sin, Proverbs 14, 9. Here is God in all of his holiness. And the Bible tells us that we've sinned against him. We've broken his laws and we're under the sentence of death. We're under the sentence of death. I saw a film tonight on television on one of the news programs telling how many men and women are on death row in the United States right now. Under the sentence of death. All of us here tonight are under the sentence of death. The wages of sin is death and we have all sinned and broken the laws of God. And so we're all sentenced to die. We are to die physically. The graveyards are full of, full of people that are there because sin caused death. And then sin also causes spiritual death. Your soul is dead. Your spirit is dead. Physically you're alive, but your soul that lives inside your body is dead toward God. 
So you're a walking dead person under the sentence of death. And the only way that you can have that sentence lifted is to come to Christ by repentance of sin and faith in Him as your Lord and your Savior. If you would like that sentence lifted, if you would like your sins wiped out as though they had never existed, if you would like to be justified in the sight of God, pick up that telephone right now, you that are watching by television. Pick it up and call the number that you see on your screen and a counselor will answer. And the counselor will talk to you about how you can come to know Christ. As many people here tonight, I hope and believe and pray, will find Christ as their Lord and Savior. But there are many people that make a mockery of sins. They mock God's standards. God's standards of sex. God's standards of marriage. God's standards concerning divorce and ethics and morality and social justice. We make a mockery of it. We laugh at it. The Bible says, be sure your sins will find you out. Don't ever doubt it. Your sin, your sin will find you out, though no one on earth may discover it. You may never be caught. You may never have to pay for it here, as far as you can tell. But your sin will someday be found out. No one ever commits one sin that isn't found out. Everything that you did in the darkness, every evil thought that you ever had is going to be found out because it'll all be recorded. It's being recorded awaiting the judgment day. It's being recorded on tape machines far more sophisticated than anything we have. It's being recorded. Even your thoughts and your sins will find you out and it'll be exposed to the whole universe. Will find you out. Will. It's only a question of time. The word will is definite. Will find you out. Find. Perhaps you've deceived everyone else. Your wife, your family, your church, your friends. But the Bible says your sin will definitely find you out. A detective at last after running away so long and hiding so long, God's hand will come on your shoulder and say, I have found you. You've been found out. We now know. And then thirdly, there's the slandering fool, the slandering fool. He that hideth hatred with lying lips and he that uttereth a slander is a fool. Passing along an evil story about others maligning other people's character, wrecking their reputations by evil gossip. Gossiping is listed in the Bible as one of the worst of all sins. And yet how frequent that's done even in circles that call themselves Christians. It's a terrible sin in the sight of God and God says that person is a fool. You wouldn't think of killing a person with a gun or a knife. But then many times we assassinate a character or try to pull someone down or to get even or because of jealousy by whispering innuendos. Someone told me or he did thus and so. We commit murder by character assassination. Worse than killing a man with a pistol, a knife or a club. He that others a slander, the scripture says, is a fool. And then fourthly, there's the Christian fool. The Christian fool. Remember the road to Emmaus after Jesus Christ had died on the cross for our sins and he'd been raised again? And remember he was appearing to the disciples, in fact, 11 different appearances after his resurrection. And this is one of them. And these two disciples were on the way to Emmaus outside of Jerusalem. They were sad. They were disappointed. They were disillusioned. And they were mumbling and groaning among themselves. And another man joined them. And they didn't recognize who he was. And he talked to them, said, why are you so downcast? They said, oh, we thought he was to be the Messiah. Haven't you heard all the happenings in Jerusalem during the past week about this Jesus who did wonderful things? We thought he was the Messiah. We thought he'd come to save the world, but he didn't. He disappointed us. They killed him on a cross and now the third day has passed and we heard rumors that he might be raised from the dead, but we don't accept that. And then Jesus said, oh fools, you're fools. 
Then he started expounding to them the scriptures from Moses through the prophets as to who he really was. And then he went to spend the evening with them and he was sitting at the meal in their home in Emmaus. And all of a sudden their eyes were open and they saw it was Jesus. In other words, the Christian fool who has the word of God in his hand, who reads his testimony and yet doubts the promises of God. Jesus said, oh, you fools, for not believing the scriptures, that he was going to rise from the dead and someday he's coming back. And then, fifthly, there's the covetous fool. And the story is told in Luke, the 12th chapter. Jesus told the story about a rich man in his barns. You remember he built his barns and he said he was going to retire because he'd made enough money now probably going to go to Southern California, Florida, come here to Idaho to this beautiful place and retire. He'd made enough money. And he said, soul, take thine ease, drink and be merry. And that night he had a heart attack. And when he was dying, there was a voice heard from heaven that said, thou fool, this night thy soul is required of thee. And the scripture says, Jesus said, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You see, he tried to find happiness in the wrong place, money. He ignored the power of influence in that no man liveth unto himself. He must have had a family. He disregarded death. He had made no provision for eternity. He had provision for his retirement. How many men and women I know who have planned for retirement, planned everything, but they haven't prepared to die and they die shortly after they retire. It's amazing. I've thought about that. Some people announce their retirement, you read two or three weeks later that they dropped dead of a heart attack. They thought they were gonna have five or 10 or 15 or 20 years if they could just take it easy and enjoy life. But it doesn't always work out that way. You better be sure that you have prepared to meet God. Every person who is more concerned about getting some of this world's goods and leaving out the preparation for eternity is a fool. Or the person who spends their time in social climbing or having pleasure more than eternal things is a fool in the sight of God. If you're not concerned about your home in heaven, you're not concerned about the riches that will never fail, not concerned about laying up treasure where moth and rust doth not corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal, then you're a fool. If you'd ask this man, what is your name? Well, he'd say, my name's the rich man. Or I'm the prosperous man that you read about. Or I'm an eminent man. I'm a great man in the neighborhood, or I'm a famous man. My name is in the paper all the time. Then ask God, Lord, what is this man's name? And the answer comes back, fool. He's a fool. That's his name. The rich man knew every name but the right one. He had been called by his family name, his given name, his ranks, his titles, his wealth, the flatteries of men. But in the sight of God, his name was Thou Fool. That's all we know about him, that he was just a rich fool. That laid up treasures on earth, but laid up nothing for heaven. And how many of us are in the same category? You may not be rich in the sense that this man was rich, but everybody in America is rich compared to Bangladesh and people that I've, where we've been in many places of the world, like in Africa, or as Victor was talking about in, in Vietnam, where he was a missionary for some years. Very few of you would stir if I would look out on this audience and say, fool, come here, I'd like to see you. How many of you would get up and come? <laughs> Very few, maybe nobody. But the Bible says, how are they brought into desolation as in a moment? Quickly, it can all end. Your dream house comes tumbling down. Trouble in the family. The wealth is gone. Here was a man, a multimillionaire perhaps, but standing a hand's breadth away from his own grave. 
counting on everything in this life, the happiness, the joy that this life could give him, and he's called in the Bible by Jesus a fool. And then seventhly, there's another kind of a fool, or sixthly, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish. 1 Corinthians 1.18, but unto us which were saved it is the power of God. What the world counts foolish, we have rested our eternal salvation on. And when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, turn your back on the pleasures and the sensual lust and things of this world, people think you're a fool. The world that does not know Christ looks foolish to me. Why can't they see? Why can't they understand? I want to grab everybody I see on the street and everybody we pass, everybody in the hotel, I want to grab them and say, look here, Christ could change your life. I see their empty faces and I, I see the ho hear the hollow laughter. And I see them drinking, trying to drink their, themselves into some happiness or taking the drugs in that hollow stare that they had. And I say, oh, if I could only just shake them loose. But you see, only the Holy Spirit can do that. I cannot do the work of the Holy Spirit for him. The Holy Spirit must convict them of sin. He must also lift this veil that's over their minds. And so salvation is of the Lord, the Bible says. If anyone desires wisdom, let him take his place in identification with Jesus Christ. What the world calls foolish, I'm resting my salvation on the cross of Christ, no matter what the world may think of him or of me. We're fools for Christ's sake, willing for the world to look at us as out of our minds, willing to be accounted as the very offscoring of the earth because we've turned to Christ. Are you one of the devil's fools? Are you willing to be a fool for Christ's sake? The Bible says in Proverbs 12, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Which road are you on? The narrow road that leads to eternal life or the broad road that leads to destruction? You have to make a choice. The scripture says, choose you this day whom you will serve. Are you going to continue to be a fool in the sight of God? Or are you going to become another kind of fool the Christ fool, that the world will call a fool and call foolishness. Because you see, when you come to Christ, there's a price to pay. And one of the prices you pay is being misunderstood by some members of your family, some people in the community, some people where you work or where you go to school. And that's what Jesus meant when he said, come and take up the cross and follow me. You see, the cross that you bear, the cross that you bear is identification with Christ. It's not some special sickness that you get or some trouble you get. It's identifying with Christ and letting people laugh at you and being willing for them to make sport of you if necessary for following Christ. That's your cross. And if you're not willing to take that cross, you cannot be his follower, he said. Are you willing to take that cross? Are you willing to turn your life totally over to Christ? Some of us have got one foot in heaven and one foot in hell as it were one foot in the world one foot in the kingdom of god and we're straddling the fence god does not allow fence straddlers you cannot be a mugwomp that's what a mugwomp is a fence straddler god christ does not allow that he allows no neutrality you can't not be both you must come all out for him and you'll find that all the way through the Bible. You'll find it all the way through the teachings of Jesus. A great crowd was following Jesus one day. And he turned and talked to them about the fact that he was going to die on the cross. And it said, many followed him no more. Why? Because they couldn't take this talk of the cross. Do you want Christ in your heart? Pick up that telephone right now if you're watching by television. Talk to that counselor. Make that call. And if, you, if it's a busy signal, call again. They'll be there all evening, all over the country. And you can talk to somebody and receive Christ into your heart tonight. Because you see, when Christ died on the cross, 
It says that the crowd down below, the mob below, ridiculed and laughed. And they said, what a fool. You saved others, but you cannot save yourself. <laughs> and Jesus was hanging there. And in heaven, 72,000 angels, 10 legions drew their swords, ready to come and rescue him. But he said, no, I love them. And when he died on the cross, he took your sins. Every sin that you've ever committed, he took on that cross. He took your death penalty for you. And because he was the son of God, and because he was sinless, he could bear your sins. And God has accepted his death as a sin offering for our sins. So that when God looks at me now, he doesn't see Billy Graham the sinner. I am a sinner. I have sinned, but I've placed my sins under the blood of Christ. And the blood that was shed on the cross washes my sins away symbolically in the sight of God so that when God looks at me he cannot see my sins and God has a unique ability that you don't have God can forget and it says that he forgets your sins in other words the tapes are erased from the time you were born till the time you die because if one sin ever remained on those tapes, you'd never make it to heaven. God is righteous and holy. And before you can get into heaven, you must be righteous too. And the only way you can get any righteousness is to be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And he offers you that righteous clothing tonight, free. You don't have to pay for it. But you have to do three things. You must repent of your sins. That means you're willing to change your way of life. You're willing to change completely and put Christ first in your life from this moment on. You may be a member of the church. You may be a Catholic, a Mormon, Jewish, Protestant, whatever you are. You need Christ. And you want to make that commitment. I'm not asking you to join a church tonight, a specific church. I'm asking you to make sure that your sins are forgiven and that you're ready for heaven. First, repent. Second, receive him by faith into your heart. Faith means trust, total commitment. It means that he becomes the pilot of your plane or he becomes the driver of your car, of your life. You turn all the decision making over to him. And that's a wonderful thing. You trust him for your salvation. And then the third thing, you're willing to obey him. Study the scriptures and pray and obey him and do what he says and be his follower no matter what the cost. I'm going to ask you to make that commitment tonight. I'm going to ask you to do what we've seen hundreds of people at each service do so far. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of the platform and say by coming, I want to make that commitment. I want to know my sins are forgiven. I want to know the sentence of death has been lifted. I want to know I'm going to heaven. Why do I ask you to come forward publicly? Because Jesus said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. Jesus said, now is the, or the scripture says, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Nowhere in the Bible does it promise that there'll ever be a tomorrow for you. It's tonight. I believe there are hundreds of people here tonight that may never have this moment again in your whole life, in which you're so close to the kingdom of God. Just get up and come. Fathers, mothers, young people, hundreds of you. You want Christ in your heart tonight. You want to make that commitment. You get up and come. Quickly. And as people are coming forward here at the Coliseum, you make that telephone call right now. The number is on your screen. And counselors are standing by, ready to help you. In 1949, a bold and dynamic young preacher set out on a journey that would have an impact on every continent for generations to come. For more than 50 years, and to more than 210 million people, Billy Graham has passionately spoken about the certainty of hope found in Jesus Christ. 
There are many things about God that I don't understand or comprehend. I accept his revelation of himself by faith. He's brought races and denominations together toward a common purpose as he's preached in 185 countries around the world. Christ belongs to all people. He belongs to the whole world. He has stood alongside presidents, met with dignitaries and world leaders. And today, Billy Graham is recognized among the most influential religious leaders in the history of the world. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to the 12th chapter of the book of Matthew. Matthew's Gospel, the 12th chapter, beginning at verse 34. Beginning at verse 34, I want to speak on the subject tonight of Jaws. And I'll tell you why I call it Jaws in just a moment. Here's the words of Jesus, Matthew 12. Old generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof at the judgment. For by the words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we want to see a sign. Show us a sign so that we can believe in you. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. You're only going to get one sign from me. And that's the sign of Jonah, who was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh, shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. During the past few months, we've been listening and hearing and reading all about the Hollywood's blockbuster of the year. It's already been viewed by one out of every four Americans. And it's the account of a killer shark in the waters around Martha's Vineyard in New England who swallows victims and delimbs a lot of victims. And they made a motion picture out of it that's shown all over the world. And Time magazine made a cover story of it. And they could only liken it to Jonah and the whale. They could only find that one literary reference in literature of Jonah and the whale. And so the front pages of our newspapers have carried story after story about how people are afraid to go swimming on the beaches in California and Oregon and Washington and up and down the East Coast this past year or this past summer. And then I read the other day about a man in Australia that lassoed a two-ton shark in Australian waters. Well, I can understand that because I've seen a many a shark in Australia. Cliff Barris and I were out swimming one day in the surf, and there came running up to us some men, and they said, watch out, the sharks are on the way. There was a shark alert up, and we were out swimming right where the sharks were supposed to be. And we had a girl in Australia that played in one of our motion pictures, The Shadow of the Boomerang. She played the part of a nurse, and she was a very wonderful girl. And she went out with her fiancé, and the boat got stuck in the water or in the sand. And she got out to help lift the boat off the sand, and she wasn't in water more than waist deep. And a shark came along and took off her leg. And she died before they could get any medical attention to her. And down in Daytona Beach, Florida, they said they had five shark attacks on humans this past year. But this is the year of the big fish stories, both factual and fictional. And it's interesting to me that at the same time this picture's come out, frightening people, 
We have another picture called the Towering Inferno and another one called Earthquake. Besides all the B pictures, with all their horror and monster pictures that are coming out to frighten people. No wonder people are biting their fingernails off and taking tranquilizers and afraid to move in their sleep at night. There's never been such an avalanche of horror and fright and some of it very sophisticated to descend upon the human race. And in addition to that, we have to think about the atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb. And so we're living at a time when people, Jesus said their hearts would fail them for fear. And today, if ever there was a frightened generation from almost every angle, it is today. But that's not what I want to talk about. I like Jonah's story, the story of Jonah and the big fish, better than I do Jaws because Jonah was saved, not destroyed by a big fish. You say, Billy, do you really believe that this fish swallowed Jonah? Notice I'm calling it a fish because the Bible says a big fish was prepared by the Lord. It doesn't call it a whale. It does in this passage in the New Testament, but in the book of Jonah, it says a big fish. I don't know what kind of fish it was. It could have been a big shark for all I know. Do you say, do you believe that actually happened? Yes, I believe it. Why? because Jesus said it did. And that's all the proof I need. If Jesus believed it, then I believe it. But I believe that it took an even bigger miracle for this particular fish to be on the very spot where Jonah was thrown overboard and then by some mysterious programming of an internal computer to deposit Jonah precisely on the spot where God wanted him to be. And with all the things that are happening in the biological world today, people have much less difficulty crediting this story than they did 50 years ago. 50 years ago, they'd laugh at Jonah and the big fish, but not today, after we've seen Jaws and some of these other things. And after all the scientific and technological achievements, and every once in a while, you'll pick up a newspaper and you'll find that a man or a crocodile or an alligator or something has been swallowed by a big fish and they found him inside the fish, having never been digested, whatever. Now, the story of Jonah is one of the most thrilling stories in all the Bible. It's only four little chapters. In fact, you could read it in about five minutes, maybe ten minutes. And the scripture says that the word of the Lord came unto Jonah and told him to go and preach judgment to the people of Nineveh. Now, Nineveh had 600,000 population. And Nineveh was a city that was very wicked and very godless and very materialistic. It was a permissive society. Sexual immorality was rampant throughout Nineveh. And God said, I'm going to destroy Nineveh. But God said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and I want you to warn them that they are going to be judged in 40 days unless they repent. But Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Every Christian that is here tonight is called to ministry. Yes, you are called. I didn't say you were called to the ministry. I said you were called to ministry. Do you know what the word ministry means? The word ministry means service. Our Lord Jesus Christ came as a servant to serve. And every Christian is called to be a servant, to serve, to serve God, to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, to serve his fellow man. Jonah was called of God to go and proclaim the message that God had given him. But secondly, Jonah refused. You know, it's tough to do the will of God. You, you say to God tonight, Lord, I'm willing to do your will. I'll do what you want me to do and go where you want me to go and be what you want me to be. And you're going to find tough going. 
Because you see, to do what God wanted him to do, it was several journeys away over mountains and forests and burning deserts. And Nineveh was the wickedest city in the world, a city of 600,000 people. He would face disease and wild beasts and highway robbers. And then when he got there, the people may stone him to death. And Jonah began to run from God. Jonah couldn't take him. So he decided to flee from the presence of God. And he went down to Joppa and he got on a boat going to Tarshish. And the scripture says he paid the fare thereof. And I want to tell you something. If you start running from the Lord, the devil will always have a boat there for you. And you'll always have the money to pay the way. And at first, it'll be smooth going. You'll say, boy, I've made the right choice. I know I'm not doing God's will, but I'm doing what I want to do. And I know that I have made the right choice. But after a while, you're going to start running into some rough seas. Then the storms and the hurricanes and the tornadoes and the rocks and the reefs are going to come. No man ever turned away from God and found happiness and peace and joy that was permanent and lasting. The psalmist asked, Whether shall I go from thy spirit or whether shall I flee from thy presence? And you know, Jonah thought he had paid the fare. And the captain thought so too. But then the storm came up and the sailors were frightened. Jonah was asleep and they said, what's wrong with our ship? Somebody on the ship must have displeased their God. And they began to pray to their gods. Isn't it strange how people began to pray when they're in trouble and maybe they haven't prayed in all their lives. They began to pray and finally Jonah told them, that he was the one after they'd cast lots and the lot came to Jonah. He confessed that he was running from God and they said, what will we do with you, Jonah? He said, throw me overboard. They said, no, we'll try something else first. And they began to row and row and row and they threw everything else over. But the storm got worse and worse and it looked like the ship was going to be wrecked. So finally in desperation, they threw Jonah over and immediately the sea calmed down. And the Bible says that Jonah was caught by a big fish. Now you think of the jaws that fish had. How wide his mouth must have been. But see, that was a specially prepared fish by God to be there at that precise moment. And let me tell you, when you run from God, you're going to be under God's judgment. And Jonah had three days and three nights in the belly of that fish to think. And brother, let me tell you, he was doing some thinking. And he was doing some praying. He was saying, Lord, save me, help me. I don't know where I am. What's happened? And God said, Jonah, I called you into my service and told you what to do and you refused me. Now, Jonah, if you're willing to repent of your sin, I'll give you another chance. And Jonah said, yes, Lord, I repent. I'll keep my vow. And the Bible says on the third day, the fish vomited up Jonah. And Jonah found himself on dry land. And the scripture says, and the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. Now, God doesn't give many of us a second chance like that. But he gave Jonah a second chance. And Jonah ran as fast as he could in every way he could straight to Nineveh. And he went up and down the streets of Nineveh crying out, Repent! Turn to God! Judgment's coming in 40 days! Repent! 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 Of course, he didn't expect anybody to repent. But do you know what happened? That was the greatest and most successful evangelistic campaign in the history of the world. There's never been anything recorded in history like it. The king, 
the people, 600,000 of them, repented and turned to God. And God spared Nineveh. Suppose everybody in Washington suddenly repented and turned to God. And the people of America turn to God as we approach this bicentennial year. What a glorious and thrilling thing it would be. And I want to tell you this, if we did it, God would spare us. But if we don't, this country is in for judgment. Tonight, you as an individual can resist God's call to you and go deeper and deeper in sin. Or you can turn back to God and obey God and do God's will. Which is it going to be? There are many of you young people that have come to Texas Tech University and you have gotten away from God. You need to come back to Him tonight and God will forgive the past and give you another chance and another moment to serve and follow him. And I'm going to ask you to do that in just a few minutes. Jonah preached the gospel of judgment. But you know, there was an interesting thing about the message that he preached. There was no mercy in it. He didn't offer the people mercy. He didn't tell them that God loved them. But tonight, I have an opportunity to say to you much more than Jonah said to the people of Nineveh. I can say to you tonight that God loves you, and God is a merciful God, and God will forgive you. But Jonah didn't say that. He just said, judgment's coming, judgment's coming, repent, repent. And the people repented. And that's why Jesus made this astounding statement. He said, the people of Nineveh are going to rise up at the judgment and testify against you. You see, they repented, never hearing the gospel of mercy and the grace of God in Jesus Christ. But you've heard the gospel of grace in Christ, and you have refused to repent. They'd never heard that Jesus Christ was to die on the cross for their sins. They didn't know that God loved them so much that he was willing to give his son to die on the cross. But in spite of that, they repented. And Jesus said, they are going to be your accusers on the day of judgment. They will testify against you. But then something very interesting happened. Jonah was upset. He didn't want none of it to repent. You see, he was obeying God's call to go and proclaim the message, but his heart still wasn't quite right with God because he was afraid that the Ninevites were going to attack his own country, Israel. And he had prophesied that judgment was coming and he didn't like the people of Nineveh. And he wanted to see judgment come. He wanted to be able to say, I told you so. But he didn't know the mercy and the grace and the love of God that would take these wicked, godless Ninevites and forgive them and change them and transform them if they would only turn to him. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is willing to forgive anybody, even you, whatever your sins are, however bad you've been. God says, I love you. I gave my son for you. I forgive you. But Jonah didn't like that, so he went outside the city and got up on top of a hill and looked down over the city, and he had a, a hard, mean scowl on his face as he looked down on the city, waiting for God to burn it up. And the hot wind and the sun came, and he was tired and he was angry. And the Bible says that God allowed during the night a gourd to grow up by a miracle and covered Jonah and the next morning a worm came and cut it off and it fell and Jonah sat there in the sun and the hot wind blowing on him and God said Jonah you're worried about that gourd 
and you love that gourd more than you do those 600,000 people of Nineveh. And that's how the book of Jonah ends. And tonight, many of you are more interested in materialism, your own personal safety. You're interested more in the things that money can buy and the comforts of life and the affluency that we've developed in the United States. You're more interested in that than you are doing the will of God and sharing in the mercy and the grace of God. And let me tell you, you're going to have to make a choice. Jesus said there are two roads of life, the broad road and the narrow road. There are two destinies, heaven and hell. There are two ways to live, two masters, materialism and God. Which is your master? Which road are you on? And God has put a little computer down inside of you. You've got a computer system down there. It's your will. And you have the ability to choose whether you're going to serve Christ and whether you're going to serve God and his kingdom and put yourself in the will of God and say, oh Lord, I'll march in your army. I'll march under your flag. I'll go out with love in my hearts to try to help change the world. I'll go out and do your will no matter what it costs, whether it's a burning desert or a steaming jungle. I'll go out even if it means I have to break up with my boyfriend who doesn't live for God. I will go out, O oh Lord, and serve you no matter what the cost. And Jesus said, count the cost. If you're not willing to pay the price, then quit it. Don't even fool with it. It's costly to follow Christ. But I want to tell you the rewards are absolutely unbelievable. The reward of joy and peace and security knowing that your sins are forgiven knowing that you're going to heaven knowing that you're in the will of God whatever comes and whatever goes I'm going to ask hundreds of you tonight to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this platform and say tonight I want Jesus Christ into my heart I want him not only as Savior but I want him as Lord I want to put myself in his hands I want his forgiveness I want his transforming power, and I'm willing to serve him if he should call me. And I'm going to ask older people and younger people, you need Christ, whoever you are, I'm going to ask you to come and stand. And after you've all come and stood, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature. Then you can go back and join your friends. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you. If you've come in a bus or a delegation from a distant city, they'll wait. It'll only take a couple of three minutes for you to come perhaps more from the upper stands. But get up and come now. Bring your friend with you. Whole families can come together. You need Christ tonight. You want Christ to be yours, and you're ready to pay the price, whatever it costs, to serve and follow Christ. You get up and come quickly from all over this stadium. We're going to wait on you right now. Men, women, young people. You say, well, Billy, why do you ask us to come? Every person Jesus called in the New Testament, he called publicly. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. It's very important that you come publicly and openly and declare yourself for Christ. Many people are already on the way. You come and join them right now. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just to go tell me he accepted Christ at a bar watching one of these telecasts, and it changed his life. That could happen to you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll-free at 1-877-772-4559. 
That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. Tonight, I want you to turn with me to the Old Testament, to Joshua, the 24th chapter. Joshua, as you know, was a great military leader. And he took the place of Moses when Moses went to be with the Lord. And the 15th verse. Now, he had called all the leaders of Israel together at a place called Shechem. And he's getting ready to die. And this is his farewell address. And during this address, he warns the people about their idolatry. He warns them that the judgments of God will fall upon them unless they live for the Lord. And here's what he says. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. If you want to serve the devil, serve him. But make a choice. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But then he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua said, if every one of you serves other idols and other gods, makes no difference. As for me and my house, we've already made a decision we are going to serve the Lord. And that's a decision that every single person here tonight has to make. You either have to decide that you're going to serve the gods of materialism all around us, or the true and the living God. And Joshua was warning the people to choose God, to follow him instead of these other gods. And so, we have to make a choice. Moses had warned Israel much earlier, a generation earlier, when he was dying. He said, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I've said before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Moses had said the same thing that Joshua is saying, separated by many years, and every generation has to hear it over and over and over again. And that's why the gospel never grows old. It applies to every generation alike. We have to make a choice. Alexander the Great was asked how he conquered the world. He said, by not wavering. And James says in the first chapter, he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. He said, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Are you unstable about your relationship to Christ? Do you waver in your relationship to Christ? Or are you totally committed to Christ as Savior and Law? Or do you waver about it? Many of you waver by the way you live. And Jesus warned the hypocrites, people who pretend one thing and live another. This was his great battle with the hypocrites in the church. 
We have old proverbs that are familiar to us all. He who hesitates is lost. Procrastination is the thief of time. A stitch in time saves nine. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Don't waver. Make a decision. Do it now. That's what Joshua was saying. And Joshua, the great military hero that had led them from victory to victory, reminded them of all the victories that God had given. And he said, serve God and live. Serve these other gods and you'll die and come under the judgment of God. And the message has not changed. Now the wars were over. But Joshua found that the people were going toward idolatry. And many times the problems of peace are greater than the problems of war. And he had called all these leaders to Shechem. Now Shechem was a place, the most historical place in all of Israel at that time. And still is today. It was where Abraham had first settled when he left Ur of the Chaldees. It was where Jacob had purchased his parcel of land. It was where the bones of Joseph had been buried when they were brought up from Egypt. And so he has, there are two mountains there. I've stood there. And on one mountain he put six of the tribes and on the other mountain he put the other six. And Joshua spoke with a mighty voice, even though he was an old man. And he reviews the history of Israel and how God had blessed them. And how they had won their victories, not by their own power and their own strategies and their own ingenuity and their own strength, but by the power of God. And the people should have been grateful to God, but instead they were now going to other gods. And we in America should be grateful to God for the blessings he's given us. But what do we find? We find that we're worshiping other gods, the gods of pleasure. The gods of lust and greed and hate. The gods of materialism. Even the gods of war. And Joshua tells them that such a condition cannot continue. They must decide whether they want to serve the idols or to serve the living God. And he will not allow any neutrality. Neither does Jesus Christ. And Joshua said you have to decide immediately now. Choose you this day, not tomorrow, this day, whom you're going to serve. And many of you are going to have to decide tonight. What is the number one priority in your life? Is the priority Christ? Or is the priority something else? Christ demands first place. There's no room on the throne of your heart for two gods. It's either Christ or it's the other God. Because I believe that emphasis must, we must lay it out straight that you cannot serve God and mammon. You must make a choice. And I found that the harder the challenge is, the greater the response. Young people today want a challenge. They want something tough and hard, all right? Give your life to Christ. He'll challenge you because he says you must deny self and take up a cross. He says, I'm going to a place of execution. Come and go with me. Deny your own selfish ambitions and lust and turn to me and go to the cross with me. Now, Paul taught that a Christian is someone who has turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. There's a film showing throughout the world this year called The Idol Maker, but a Christian is an idol breaker. And regardless of their decision, Joshua said, it's for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. You know, Adam and Eve had to make a choice in the Garden of Eden. God said, if you want to build a wonderful world, we'll build it together. But I'm going to test you because I've given to you the ability to choose. I haven't made you a robot in which I could punch a button and you would obey me. I've made you in my image. You have the right to choose. So when Adam and Eve faced that choice, they chose wrongly. They broke the law of God. And God said, in the day that you do, you will suffer and die. And man has been suffering ever since. And it's all because of that first sin in the Garden of Eden. 
And man has been inheriting that tendency to sin ever since. The seed of sin is in us when we're born. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. Think of it now. At conception, sin was already planted. And then comes the age of accountability, moral accountability, maybe eight or nine or ten years of age, when you are held accountable by God for your actions and you choose to sin. And then the rest of your life you practice sin. You're born toward sin. You choose to sin at a certain point, And then you practice sin. And the Bible says we have all sinned. And we're all idolaters. Now Adam had to make a choice and he made the wrong choice. You have to make a choice. Many of you that are watching by television, I hope that you'll use that telephone number right now and call in and make the choice for Christ and say to that counselor, as for me in my house, I choose the Lord. And then many choices, like the rich young ruler. Remember, he came to Jesus and he was filled with questions and he wanted eternal life and he said, Sir, what must I do to find eternal life? And Jesus said, looked at him and loved him and said, Go sell all that you have. Give it to the poor. Take up the cross. Follow me. The young man was grieved. He wept. He wanted Christ. But he wanted his money more. Now, if he had said, all right, I'll do it, Lord, I'm sure the Lord would have said, no, it's not your money I want. I want your heart. It's our attitude toward these idols and toward the, these things. The television itself can become an idol. When we walk into the room, all conversation stops and we sort of sit there in reverence watching that box to see if J.R. is going to be shot again. Now, the Bible says we must choose two ways of life. Jeremiah had written, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. There's a way of life, there's a way of death. Which way are you on? Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way. I'm the only way. I'm the only way to permanent peace. I'm the only way to permanent joy. I'm the only way to eternal life. I'm the only way to forgiveness of sin. I'm the only way to the Father. You have to come by me. And that eliminates a lot of people. When Jesus began to talk about dying on the cross, a lot of his followers left him. They said, Lord, we thought you were going to sit up on a big throne and we were going to drive in Cadillacs and we were going to have beautiful swimming pools and lovely ladies and all the rest of it. We didn't really know that you were going to die and wanted us to go with you. We thought this was going to be a kingdom and we were going to overthrow Rome and we were going to rule the world. And that is going to happen someday. But not now. The cross before the crown. Some of us want the crown before the cross. The Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. What are some of the ways? Well, some people say, I'm going to follow my conscience. But you don't follow your conscience. Many of us have dead consciences. Your conscience is no longer a safe guide. You've hardened it. You've deadened it. And then other people say, well, I try to be sincere in everything I do. We're, we're here on a football stadium right here. And many years ago, I saw a man pick up a football and he ran 65 yards the wrong way. Now, he was one of the most sincere fellows you ever saw. <laughs> Lost the game. And then there are many people that say, well, you know, I do a lot of good works and I give money to charitable causes and I, I do all that. I, I'm sure God will understand. The Bible says, for by grace are ye saved, through faith, not, not that not of yourselves, but the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, if you could work your way to heaven and pay your way to heaven, you'd get up and say, look what I did. I got myself here by my own good works. 
The only way you're ever going to make it is to come to that cross where Christ took our sins and our judgment and our hell and identify ourselves with him. And then there are some people that say, well, I'll reform.